So I decided to give you guys a jam packed session and release three videos. Grab your piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we'll look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at placenta abruption. Carrying on from placenta previous as that we will cover all the major causes of antipartum hemorrhage. And the last of the third videos I will release today is pretty much going to summarize everything and tie everything up when we discuss antipartum hemorrhage. So remember, as we continue, we already established that placenta abruption is actually one of the most common causes of antipartum hemorrhage. And antipartum hemorrhage itself is going to be bleeding, vaginal bleeding, that's bleeding into the genital tract, or carrying from 24 weeks to delivery of the baby. And you have to note that some people actually use a low age of viability of 20 weeks of gestation, while others use a much higher age of viability of 28 weeks of gestation. Now remember that when you talk about placenta abruption, you can also refer to it as abruptio placenta, which is pretty much your premature separation of the placenta from its attachment to the wall of the uterus. This is usually going to be happening after 20 weeks of gestation. We have actually seen that the peak incidence actually is going to be happening somewhere around 24 weeks to 30 to 26 weeks rather and it's actually the commonest cause of late trimester bleeding so it's we see one case in every 120 pregnancies it's actually also considered as the commonest cause of painful remember that the commonest cause of painless bleeding is going to be your placenta previa the commonest cause of painful bleeding in a late pregnancy is pretty much going to be your placenta abruption it's also the commonest cause of obstetric disseminated intravascular coagulation. Now remember that in placenta abruption, this is going to be considered as an obstetric emergency. Why is this so? It's because there is an increase in morbidity and mortality of both the woman and the fetus or the neonate. But remember that in placenta abruption, the danger is actually going to be with both the mother and the fetus, but the danger is highest in the fetus than it is in the mother. Contrast this with our placenta previa. Remember that placenta previa we had it being much more dangerous for the mother than the fetus but here it's dangerous for both the mother and the fetus but it is more dangerous for the fetus. And if you look at the location of the placenta as compared to placenta previa where we have the placenta in the lower segment here it's not. It's actually in the normal position so it can be in the anterior uterine wall, posterior uterine wall or the fundus of the uterus. Now remember that any painful bleeding that's going to be happening after 24 weeks of gestation, you should consider it as abruption until you prove otherwise. Any painless bleeding that comes into the hospital after 20 weeks of gestation, consider it to be placenta previa until proven otherwise. Meaning that if anyone comes in with bleeding after 20 weeks, these are the two things that you should have in mind. Your placenta abruption, your placenta previa. Meaning that you should take your history, you should order for an ultrasound before you actually decide to perform a vaginal examination on this woman. Now remember that there are some varying degrees of separation from a few millimeters to actually complete detachment of the placenta and it may actually be acute or chronic. A chronic type of abruption can actually be associated with intrauterine fetal restriction, intrauterine growth restriction and of course the separation results in bleeding into the decidual B salis behind the placenta. So you have this bleeding happening retroplacentally. Now what are some of the risk factors? Remember that having one condition puts you at risk of having it again. So the previous history of placenta abruption 
there's actually a 5 to 17 percent increase if someone has had it before and of course advancing maternal age multiparity those that are above five and the this is three times more common that they'll have placenta abruption and the most single most important risk factor is actually hypertension whether it's hypertension associated with pregnancy in the form of preeclampsia gestational hypertension or just essential chronic hypertension superimposed on the pregnancy are associated with placenta abruption now you may ask why remember that in hypertension or especially in preeclampsia there's going to be spasm of the vessels and these vessels that are found in the utero placental bed pretty much your decidual spiral arteries now remember that whenever blood vessels are spasming or the undergo spasms i don't know if spasming is the correct word when they undergo spasms this is pretty much going to be leading to your anoxia meaning no oxygen is going to go to the endothelium and this is going to lead to endothelial damage it's going to lead to rupture of blood vessels extravasation of the blood into the decidual basalis and then this is obviously going to form your retroplacental hematoma maternal trauma is another significant risk factor it could e either be blunt or sharing trauma such as in an rta this obviously leads to a marginal separation with escape of blood outside and of course the trauma may be due actually to attempt what is referred to as an external cephalic version under anesthesia using great force it could be due to rtas it could be due to blows over the abdomen or even needle punctures in an amniocentesis smoking and cocaine have also been implicated remember that these are potent vasoconstrictors they also cause vasospasms and of course ischemia ischemic damage or anoxic damage that's going to lead to rupture of blood vessels and extravasation of the blood you may also have intraamniotic infections like chorioamnionitis uterine anomalies like for example if the placenta is over the septum or a septate uterus you may sometimes have fibroids especially with the submucosal fibroids you may have placenta anomalies like a circumvalent placenta a sick placenta where there is like poor placentation and even evidence of abnormal uterine doppler waveforms you may have a short cord which is either relative or absolute which can actually bring separation of the placenta during labor because of the mechanical pull other risk factors include premature rupture of membranes bleeding diathesis or dyscrasias like thrombophilias which could be inherited or acquired disorders rapid decompression of an over distended uterus as we see with multiple gestations with polyhydramnios and premature rupture of membranes there could be poor socioeconomic conditions nothing is ever associated with being poor nothing good ever comes from that you could have some malnutrition folic deficiency is a very important one so there is some evidence that even if they don't have features of megaloblastic um, anemia they are there is an association between folic acid deficiency and placenta abruption then there is something that's known as supine hypotensive syndrome which occurs in pregnancy where there is engorgement of the uterine and the placental vessels which results in rupture and extravasation of blood for example when someone lying supine you have the compression of the the inferior vena cava and those blood vessels in the midline then of course you may have torsion of the uterus of course this leads to increase in venous pressure rupture of the veins with separation of the placenta you may have vasculitis and other vascular disorders cocaine abuse which we talked about that may cause transient hypertension vasospasms as well as placenta abruption now what actually is the etiopathogenesis what actually happens remember that the exact cause is not really known but there is a higher incidence of having it in uh, the multiparous women especially those that are g5 and above three times the risk and of course maternal age and hypertension are risk factors as well as trauma whatever may be causing this there is a premature separation that's going to be initiated and obviously when the placenta is partly separated from the attachment to the uterine wall this is going to be leading to hemorrhage and the decidual basalis now remember that the blood that collects there forms what is known as a decidual hematoma and in the early phase it hardly actually produces any prominent pathological changes in the uterine wall or even on the placenta but depending on the extent of the pathology there may be some degeneration there may be some necrosis of the decidual basalis as well as the placenta that was adjacent to it and then of course rupture of the basal plate may also occur and this can actually cause the, the hematoma to actually uh, communicate with the intervillous space 
the decidual hematoma can actually be quite small and self-limiting and the entity can actually be seen when the placenta is delivered where you actually see this blood clot that is attached to the placenta when you examine the placenta after delivery. Now the features of a retro placental hematoma obviously going to be a depression that's going to be found on the maternal side of the placenta with a blood clot which may be found firmly attached to this area. You may also have areas of infarction with varying degrees of organization. Now remember that if the spinal arteries are actually ruptured, a big hematoma is going to form and the uterus uh, remains distended by the conceptus and if it and remember that once you have the uterus failing to contract remember that the blood vessels in the uterus are going to be occurring in between the muscles so it means that even when the uterus is, is not really contracting the blood vessels are not going to be clamped on it's very easy for actually the bleeding to keep going on because the uterine contractions are not really happening now in some cases you may have a certain pathological entity that I want you to keep very very much attention on because it shows up on your exams. This is known as a Kuvalase uterus or you can refer to it as uterine placental apoplexy. Now this was first described by Kuvalare and this was actually in patients that encountered severe forms of placenta abruption especially the concealed placenta abruption. Now this is just a very very fancy term just to mean extraversation or rather massive intraversation of blood into the uterine musculature up into the serous coat. So you have this blood that is leaking into the muscle layers in between the muscles. And we can only make a diagnosis of this when we visualize the uterus when we're doing a laparotomy. So microscopically, it's going to appear like a dark port wine color. And of course, this may be in patches or it may be a significant area of the uterus. And of course, it tends to be initially on the corneal before it spreads to other areas and more especially over the placental site. Subperitoneal uh, petechial hemorrhage can sometimes be found under the uterine peritoneum, and this may actually extend into the broad ligament of the uterus, and there may, be some free, uh, there may be some free blood in the peritoneal cavity as well as in the broad ligament. Uh, hem you may also see a broad ligament hematoma. Then microscopically, when you look at this under the microscope, you're going to be seeing areas of necrosis. You're going to be seeing areas where there's infiltration of blood. There's going to be fluid in between the muscle bundles. And of course, most of the muscle dissociation occurs in the middle and the outer muscle layers. Of course, the serosa may split on occasions to allow the blood to actually enter into the peritoneal cavity. And remember that the blood vessels are going to show these acute degenerative changes with fibros with thrombosis rather. Now here, this is what a Kuvalase uterus looks like. So it looks like as if this is this uterus has been beaten up. Now remember that whether you have this myometrial hematoma inside or these red blood cells inside the muscle area, this actually is not going to interfere with the contractility of the uterus. So it doesn't really affect the contractility of the uterus. So this is not really an indication for hysterectomy per se. Now what about the other systems? How are they affected? Remember that in the liver you may see these features of preeclampsia if they are present. So you may see these fibrin knots in the hepatic sinusoids. In the kidneys there may be acute cortical necrosis or acute tubular necrosis. You may develop shock proteinuria which is obviously due to renal anoxia which usually disappears two days after the delivery. Then the proteinuria may be due to preeclampsia and may actually last a bit longer. You may also have some blood coagulopathy. We, remember we say that this is actually one of the most important or the most common causes of obstetric DIC. Now this is going to be due to what is referred to as a consumptive coagulopathy, where you use up most of your plasma fibrinogen. Then of course this is going to lead to the DIC. You, know? so you may also have a retroplacental bleeding. Now there is hypofibrogenemia where there is a concentration of fibrinogen that is less than 150 milligrams per deciliter and there's going to be elevated fibrin degradation products which are pretty much your D-dimers which you can check for when you examine this woman and you order for some investigations. Now what exactly are the types of bleeding that you may have? So you may have uh, pretty much your revealed bleeding or you may have concealed hemorrhage. So your revealed or overt or sometimes referred to as external placenta abruption is the much more common variant where you have this premature separation of the placenta. And of course you have your retroplacental clot. You also have your vaginal bleeding. Now remember that in this scenario, you're going to be having the blood that's going to be dissecting through 
in between the plasma membrane and the decidua, and then eventually it's going to exit into the vagina. I'll show you a picture just in the next slide. Then on in 20% of the cases, you may have a concealed bleeding or an internal placenta abruption. So this is where you have now varying degrees of separation, but the clot is hidden behind the placenta and the blood doesn't find its way outside of the vagina. So the, the collection of blood is going to be between the separated placenta and the membranes and the decidua. And of course, this collected blood is prevented from actually coming out through the cervix by the presenting part, which presses on the lower segment. And at times, the blood may actually move into the amniotic sac such that when you rupture the membranes, you're going to get this characteristic color of the amniotic fluid. Now, this may actually range in severity and may actually be very dangerous for the fetus. It's quite hard to diagnose and usually we diagnose it using an ultrasound. Now, the only thing that may hint you is that you may get some tenderness over the uterus. The uterus may begin to enlarge and this woman will be in shock out of proportion with whatever you may see or you may deem as the blood loss. And of course, you may sometimes have a mixed variant where you have some of the blood coming out and some of it being concealed. Usually there's one variant that usually predominates over the other. And this is actually the much, much more common variant that we see in the population. Now here is a placenta abruption with revealed hemorrhage. As we can see here, the tear is almost at the edge and it's moving through the membranes and then uh, at the different layers of the decidua, between the decidua and the membranes and then eventually passing through uh, through the vagina over there. Then of course here you have a retroplacental hematoma that has actually collected behind the placenta and that presenting part may actually be, be preventing the blood from exiting uh, just like we have in the revealed hemorrhage. So this is the concealed type. Then what about the severity? We can actually grade it into three main grades. Grade zero where the clinical features are absent. The diagnosis is usually made after inspection of the placenta after the delivery where you see the blood clot and you realize oh this woman actually had a, an abruption. Most of these tend to be chronic ab, uh, abruptions. Then, of course, you may have a grade one, which is mild. In 40% of the cases, you get minimal vaginal bleeding, you, no fetal anomalies on the monitor. And of course, the uh, uterus is irritable, it's tender. This may or may not be there. And of course, you may get some localized uterine pain and tenderness, uh, which is noted with incomplete relaxation, incomplete relaxation of the contractions, and then you may get maternal rises in the BP as well as the uh, fibrinogen levels, but in most of the cases, these are not really affected. Especially the BP it may not be affected unless if there's an underlying pathology. Fibrinogen levels also remain normal. Then of course, in grade two, which is moderate, 45%, which is the most common, mild to moderate vaginal bleeding, uterine tenderness, you may get a raised maternal pulse, and the BP is maintained. The fibrinogen levels may actually decrease because now you're starting to use up fibrinogen to stop the bleeding that's happening. And of course, the, the woman may present you in shock and the fetal monitor may actually show tachycardia, decreased variability or even mild late decelerations, which are usually not a reassuring thing to see on the fetal monitoring. And of course, in the grade three, which is severe, which is in 15% here, there's moderate to severe bleeding or it may sometimes be concealed. There's marked uterine tenderness. And of course, this is going to feel like as if it's a knife-like pain in the uterus. The shock is quite pronounced. And then of course, there's greater than 50% of separation that's going to be occurring. So here, there are going to be severe late decelerations, bradycardia, or even fetal death. It may be associated with coagulation defect or anuria. Then of course, here is a partial separation. Here is a marginal separation. Here is a concealed separation or a complete separation with a concealed hemorrhage. This is the most dangerous type. Now, the clinical features pretty much depend on the severity, as I've already explained, the degree of separation, and then, of course, the amount of blood that is concealed inside the uterus. But generally, women are going to present you with number one, vaginal bleeding, Number two, uterine contractions with abdominal tenderness. Number three, decreased or absent fetal movements on your history. And when you examine this woman, there may be some ab abdominal or uterine tenderness. Of course, this is going to be suggesting extravasated blood into the myometra. Remember the cover layers, uterus. There may be signs and symptoms of shock. There may be fetal distress or even an absent fetal heart sounds. Now, here's the difference between the revealed hemorrhage versus our concealed hemorrhage, where the concealed part actually predominates. 
So in the revealed part, you're going to be having abdominal discomfort or pain followed by vaginal bleeding. This is usually slight. Here you just have abdominal acute intense pain that is followed by slight vaginal bleeding and the pain becomes rather continuous. The character of the bleeding here is it's continuous, dark, slight to moderate. Here it's continuous, dark, usually slight, or it can be blood-stained serous discharge. The general condition in the revealed hemorrhage is usually proportionate to the visible blood loss and the shock is usually absent. On the other hand, with concealed hemorrhage, it's usually out of proportion with the blood that you are seeing because there is some more blood that is collecting behind the placenta and only a little may be coming out. In revealed hemorrhage, the parlor is related to the visual, visible blood loss. Here it may actually be out of proportion with the blood that has been lost. The features of preeclampsia are usually absent. In revealed hemorrhage, they're usually associated with concealed hemorrhage. And of course, the uterine height is usually proportionate to the period of gestation. Here, it may be disproportionately large because there's blood that's collecting inside the uterine cavity. And of course, the uterus may appear globular. Then the, the feel of the uterus here may be normal with some localized tenderness and some uh, frequent contractions. And um, on the other hand here, the uterus is tense, it's tender. And then of course, it's also going to be rigid. So it's woody hard kind of consistency. Then the fetal parts here can easily be identified here. They're very difficult to make out. They are usually present in revealed hemorrhage. They're usually absent in mixed or concealed hemorrhage. Then of course the urine output is normal in revealed hemorrhage and it's diminished in this concealed type of hemorrhage. Now when you go on and look at the labs, here in revealed you will get a low HP that's going to predominate because this patient is losing blood. Here you're going to have a low HP that's usually out of proportion with the visible blood loss that's you have and that already makes sense and of course you can get a coagulation profile which is usually unchanged in revealed hemorrhage you may get some changes in the concealed hemorrhage things like an increase in clotting time low fibrinogen levels low platelet count increased partial thromboplastin time increased fibrin degradation products and even d-dimers the urine proteins are usually absent in revealed hemorrhage because it's not even associated with preeclampsia while it's in the concealed hemorrhage is usually present. And of course, you may, you may actually confuse revealed hemorrhage with placenta previa, so you should actually wait until you get an ultrasound before you actually do your vaginal examination. Then the concealed hemorrhage is usually confused with other obstetrical, gynecological, and even some surgical conditions. Now remember that shock is going to be due to blood loss, it's going to be due to hypovolemia, or it could be due to the coagulopathy. If someone has mild hemorrhage that's less than 15% of their blood volume, generally it's not going to be associated with any changes in the vital signs. If they have moderate hemorrhage where there is loss of 15 to 30% of their blood volume, then this is going to be associated with features like tachycardia, hypotension, decreased pulse pressure, mean, and as well as decreased mean arterial pressure, whereas those that have severe hemorrhage that's lost as greater than 30 to 40% of their blood volume, they're going to have the features of shock. Now what's our diagnosis going to be? Remember here you, you typically have a woman that's going to be presenting with painful late trimester vaginal bleeding with a normal fundus or a normal fundal height or lateral uterine wall placenta implantation which is not over the lower segment. So when you do an ultrasound it's not over the lower segment and it's painful vaginal bleeding. Then of course the diagnosis can also be considered if number one this person has vaginal bleeding in the first trimester, whether it's painful or painless, we should consider placenta abruption. If there's uterine pain or tenderness, if there's fetal distress or fetal death, if there's hemorrhagic shock, if there's DIC, if there's tenderness or shock disproportionate to the degree of vaginal bleeding, even if it's in the first trimester, or rather after the first trimester, you should suspect placenta abruption. Then of course the amount of vaginal bleeding is not, re is not really a reliable indicator of severity. Remember that we can actually lose a little amount of blood and this woman could be shocked and it could actually be confusing. The reason why this could happen is because you could sometimes have a concealed hematoma. Now remember that here the fundal height, the abdominal girth are going to be useful to actually monitor the retroplacental blood collection. Now what investigations are we going to do? We're pretty much going to order for an ultrasound. So here you can actually see the retroplacental collection of blood. You need more than 300 mils to actually visualize it by your sonography. Remember that only 2% of the abruption actually going to be visualized on the ultrasound. 
So what does this mean to us? It means that if you get a normal ultrasound, this does not completely rule out this woman not having placenta abruption. It doesn't rule out the absence of placenta abruption. But of course, with the ultrasound uh, localization of the hemorrhage can be retroplacental, meaning it's between the placenta and the myometrium. It could be subchorionic, meaning it's between the placenta and the amniotic fluid, so it's within the amnion and the chorion. It could be a pre-placental, meaning it's between the placenta and the amniotic fluid, so within the uh, the amnion and the, the chorion, so this is also known as a subamniotic. And of course, the fetal prognosis depends on certain factors. It's going to depend on the size, the type of the hematoma, and remember that the retroplacental carries the worst prognosis because it has the highest fetal mortality rates. The subchorionic usually are small sized and they have like less than 10%, and then the subamniotic are, are clinically they're less significant. And of course, early hemorrhage is going to be hyperechoic or isoechoic. And of course, that's how it's going to look like on ultrasound. I'll show you a picture in F in the next slide. And of course, acute hemorrhage can sometimes be confused with a fibroid or a thick placenta. And uh, negative findings with ultrasound do not exclude placenta previa. That's what I've been telling you about. You may sometimes get a port wine discoloration of the amniotic fluid, which is rather very suggestive of abruption. Remember when I told you that there may be some discoloration of the amniotic fluid this can be pointing us towards placenta previa then of course the, you should also do your uh, clotting profile your coagulation profile including your pt your ptt your d dimers your fibrinogens your bedside clotting time if it's greater than 10 minutes you should organize fresh frozen plasma because there's a risk of coagulopathy also order for a full blood count to estimate the hp and hematocrit do a urinalysis as well as a clue heart beta k test if the patient is, of course, rhesus negative, because you want to calculate the dose of Rogam, which is your anti-D antibodies, your anti-D immunoglobulins. Now, here is a picture of an abruption. So here you have the placenta over here, and you have the hemorrhage. As you can see, the placenta is, and this is quite a huge, huge one. So in uh, this schematic here, you have this as your concealed hemorrhage. Then B here is your revealed hemorrhage. Then C here is your marginal or your subchorionic. Then D here is your pre-placental. You can refer to it as your subamniotic, the different types of placenta abruption. Now, what's our differential diagnosis? If it's a revealed type, you should consider placenta previa. If it's mixed or concealed, consider things like rupture of the uterus, rectal sh rectus sheath hematomas, Append appendicular and even intestinal perforation, twisted ovarian tumors, volvulus, acute hydramnios, even tonic uterine contractions. Now, the essential points that are going to help you arrive to a concealed placenta abruption are going to be the following things. Number one, you're going to be having a shock that's out of proportion to the external bleeding. You're going to have unexplained extreme pallor. You may have features of preeclampsia. The uterus is going to be tense, tender, or woody hard. The fetal sounds may be absent. There may be a diminished urinary output and, of course, presence of blood coagulation disorders. These are the things that should be keying you and taking your curiosity and your mind that this woman could have a concealed placenta abruption. Now, how are we going to manage this woman? So pretty much this is an obstetric emergency. So you admit the patient, you do your ABC. So you assess for the amount of blood that is lost. The maternal vital signs such as the pulse, the BP, the level of consciousness are very good. The maturity of the fetus and the well-being so we make sure we check the fetal heart sounds then whether the patient is in labor or not usually the labor starts immediately you get abruption usually the labor is going to start then of course the presence of any complications the type and the grade of placenta abruption so when you're doing your abcs don't forget to check that the air is patent the patient is breathing if they need oxygen give them oxygen to maintain their saturations and of course gain access with your white ball cannulae send your blood for hemoglobin and hematocrit estimations, your coagulation profiles, your ABO blood groupings, and of course, you should secure at least four units. Then start running your ringers lactate as you await for other solutions or the blood that you have sent for. Catheterize the patient, do a urinalysis to check for any proteins in the urine, monitor the urine output, then closely monitor the fetal and maternal condition. Now, in most of the cases, the immediate or definitive management is, of course, delivery and the management of any other complication that may arise. There's very, very little role for us to dilly-dally and wait for expectant management because usually this is very 
are fatal to the baby. So the mode and the timing of the delivery depends on the condition and the gestational age of the fetus. It, it depends on the condition of the mother and of course the state of the cervix. The possibility of this woman being able to give birth vaginally or by c-section depending on whether there are some contraindications to vaginal delivery. Now if the patient is in labor, if the patient is at term, the labor is usually accelerated where we rupture, we perform a low rupture of the membranes. Then of course the rupture of the membranes with escape of the lyqua actually accelerates the labor and it increases the uterine tone. And of course oxytocin drip can be started to accelerate the labor would never need it. And remember that when are we supposed to carry out a vaginal delivery? Number one, if there's limited placenta abruption, if it's not the whole thing that is separated, because if it's the whole placenta, you have to rush this woman to theater. And of course, you if there's a reassuring fetal heart tracing, if the facility has uh, features of, or rather machine that can continuously monitor the fetus that is available, and if the prospect of vaginal delivery, meaning a bishop score, is it's quite uh, promising, and the prospect of vaginal delivery is very soon. And of course, placenta abruption with a dead fetus, we don't want to take a woman to C-section with a fetus that's already dead. So we want to wait it out until she delivers vaginally, unless otherwise. Then of course, advantages of amniotomy are going to include things like it's initiating myometrial contractions and the labor process. It actually expedites the labor, the delivery. And of course, there is better uh, compression of the uterine artery to arrest the hemorrhage because as labor starts, remember that as the uterus is contracting, the blood vessels in between the heart, the, why do I say the heart? The uterine muscles actually clamp down it. This actually helps with the bleeding. And of course, this reduces the entry of thromboplastin into the maternal circulation. Remember that the release of thromboplastin into the circulation is what's actually going to be causing DIC. It's what's actually going to be causing renal cortical necrosis. So this reduces the risk of these things. And of course, if the patient is not in labor, if the bleeding is continuous or greater than grade one abruption, we want to deliver them either by induction of labor through low rupture of membranes or by C-section. Now, oxytocin may be added to actually to expedite the, the delivery and labor is usually going to start uh, soon in the majority of the cases. And delivery is uh, completed very, very quickly in actually about four to six hours. Then the placenta with varying amounts of retro placental clot is actually expelled most often simultaneously with delivery of the baby. Do not forget to give an infusion of oxytocin or you can actually give an injection of methagene, 0.2 milligrams and 10 international units for oxytocin, 0.2 milligrams for methagene with delivery of the baby. Of course, this is to reduce postpartum hemorrhage. Then of course, with cesarean section, if there's severe abruption with the live fetus, take them for C-section. If there's amniotomy that could not be done, if there's an unfavorable uh, cervix, take them for your um, C-section. If the prospect of immediate vaginal delivery is remote, despite you having ruptured the membranes, take them for C-section. If amniotomy has failed to control the bleeding, take them for C-section. If amniotomy has failed to arrest the process of abruption, there's a, a continuous raising fundus, take them for C-section. Of course, if there is appearance of adverse features like fetal distress, a falling fibrinogen level, even oliguria, take the patient for a C-section. Now remember that during the C-section, regional anesthesia generally is going to be avoided uh, because there is a significant hemorrhage that is there. And this is also done to avoid the profound and persistent hypotension that we see in these patients. Now, if the heart rate is present and the patient is fully dilated, then you can actually perform a vacuum extraction. If the fetal heart is present and the fetus is viable and the prospect of delivery is quite very far, then you have to deliver them via C-section. If the, the bleeding is heavy and there's a high risk of maternal mortality and vaginal delivery is very far, take them to C-section regardless of the fetal status. Because if the mother is in jeopardy, deliver them regardless. If the fetus is in jeopardy, deliver them regardless. And of course, if abruption is mild and the pregnancy is remote from term, we can do some expectant management. But the goal of this is that we want to prolong this in the hope that we can get some fetal maturity such that once the fetus has been delivered, the fetus will survive outside the womb. So the patient should actually be observed in the labor ward for 24 to 48 hours to ensure that there's no further separation of the placenta. 
that's going to be occurring. Meanwhile, we're going to be giving our dexamethasone or beta-methasone to accelerate our lung maturity in the fetus. Now, when you manage those patients, especially in the third stage of management of labor, you have to keep in mind that there is a high risk of postpartum hemorrhage. So we have to manage them with active management of third stage of labor. So if there is a hypertension that is there, then we manage the fluid balance with care because we don't want to tip them into pulmonary edema or renal failure. So we give the fluids with caution. And of course, you should do your bedtime clotting time. Uh, if it's greater than 10 minutes, organize FFP because there's a risk of coagulopathy. Now, placenta abruption is actually a relative contraindication for tocolysis. Uh, tocolysis, which is pretty much, um, or rather tocolysis, which is pretty much stopping the uterine contractions or aborting the uterine contractions with certain medication. Now, the fetal maternal hemorrhage is actually a, a common with traumatic variants of um, placenta abruption. And remember that if we stop, if we cause the uterus to actually relax, we may actually worsen the bleeding. Then of course, to combat the fetal maternal hemorrhage, we give 300 milligrams of anti-D immunoglobulins to all RH negative women. The amount of fetal to maternal uh, blood loss is actually usually less than 15 mils. Here's a schematic to help you with the management. So a woman comes in and you suspect abrapsio placenta, we perform a general end abdominal examination, we check for the fetal status, we grade the abruption, and of course the, we do an FBC, we check for hematocrit, we also do a coagulation profile, an ABO and RH blood grouping. Emergency measures are going to be including infusion with crystalloids, a blood transfusion, periodic coagulation profiles, urine output monitoring and fetal monitoring, preferably continuous. So we resuscitate the patient. If it's revealed and the patient is not in labor, we perform artificial rupture of membranes, we pass on minus oxytocin, vaginal delivery, unless if vaginal delivery is contraindicated. If the patient is not in labor, we deliver them. Then of course, delivery depends on certain things. If we perform artificial rupture of membranes and plus or minus oxytocin, then they deliver vaginally, then we, con we continue to deliver them vaginally. Otherwise, if there are other indications for C-section, we deliver them via C-section. If it's concealed hemorrhage, then Obviously, we want to deliver the patient, so we either artificially rupture the membrane if the prospect of vaginal delivery is very close, but this is in a very few selected cases. In most of the cases, we perform our cesarean delivery. Then, of course, we should continue the oxytocins even after delivery to prevent postpartum hemorrhage. Now, what are some of the complications? There may be maternal, including shock, which is due to maternal blood loss, blood coagulation disorders like a disseminated intravascular coagulation. Of course, this is because there's release of thromboplastin into the maternal circulation, and this can actually cause disseminated intravascular coagulation. The second reason is that there could be a release of amniotic emboli that may cause uh, the blood to clot all over the body in the mother and using up the fibrinogen. Then, of course, in this case, we'll want to give four units of FFP and get six units of platelets ready. And of course, there may be cardiac failure, you may have renal failure, postpartum hemorrhage, which is attributed to the uterine atony and increased serum fibrin degradation products. You may have proprosepsis, maternal mortality, which is either due to hemorrhage, DIC, cardiac failure, or renal failure. This is in about 0.5 to about 5% of patients. In some cases, you may have a complication that's known as Sheehan syndrome, which is known as failure to lactate. So you get a history of a woman that had placenta abruption or even PPH, where now they were in a state where they lost a lot of blood and then eventually the uh, pituitary gland was ischemic. Now remember that the pituitary gland is going to be producing prolactin, which is essential for the production of milk. So they're usually one of the signs that's going to be uh, recognized in this mother after they give birth, after this complication, is that they'll fail to actually produce milk. So it's usually a failure of lactation. Now the recurrence is, an, is about 10% after the first abruption and 25% after the second abruption. Fetal complications include fetal demise in 10 to 35%, which is due to hypoxia, exangiation, or complications of prematurity. And then of course, there's also an increased risk of congenital anomalies. I really hope you learned a lot and you now understand about placenta abruption and pretty much how to approach placenta abruption and how to make a diagnosis and how to manage these patients. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu to Zambia and beyond. Catch you in the next video. Until next time, bye-bye.